Anyway, let's do this. Dr. Ron, um, we're live, mate. Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me. I want to start with you. Like it's a little atypical a dentist being so into wellness and and I think for most people they they think of dentistry as a compliance exercise as opposed to a a place you go to 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 get well but I'd I'd love to just get a little bit of your backstory and how being a dentist has morphed into to really being a a, a wellness practitioner and coach. Mm. Well, I mean uh, I've been doing it now for almost 40 years. In fact, I have been doing it for 40 years. I've got to stop saying that. Um, and very soon after I graduated, I found myself treating people with chronic pain, headaches and neck aches, and that wasn't something we covered in dental school. School, but I had a couple of patients where uh, they would come in and uh, and I um, adjust a new patient, something wasn't comfortable. I thought, well, it hasn't been comfortable for five years. I might just adjust this new crown, new crown that had been there for five years. And mm. I did. And they came back a week later and they said, how is it? And I said, how is it? And they said, it's really comfortable. But what's really interesting is this headache that I'd also had for five years is gone. Mm. And uh, that had happened to me on a couple of occasions and I thought there had to be something going on here and in fact led me into a whole area of dentistry that we never covered in dental school and that was chronic musculoskeletal pain, headaches, neck aches, jaw pain. And that is the beginning of a journey that is still going on to this very day. But uh, about two or three years after, I and I was doing every course I could in America and the UK and Australia and uh, about three years in, I attended a course which presented me with a philosophy of healthcare to do with chronic pain, but it actually translates, mm. which said our health is affected by stress. And we thought, well, yeah, that's pretty obvious. Yeah. But we define stress as a combination of emotional, environmental, postural, nutritional mm. and dental stress. And so uh, began my journey. Now, at that time, I was in my 20s. I didn't feel comfortable talking to people about emotional stress. Mm. Um, environmental stress was a very new thing in 1983, um, at least to me and most of the people in, at university level. When you say environmental stress, you mean the environment that we live in? The environment As that we live in outside of our homes and inside of our yeah, homes. And, yeah. and, and in fact, at that time, the focus was very much on outside of our homes, air pollution, water pollution. Got it. Got um, it. So I wasn't really ready for that, but I could explore nutritional stress, which I did my first, I'd already done my first nutrition degree, oh, not degree, but a nutrition course mm -hmm. in about 1982. And um, How was that in 1982? What did they teach you back then? Well, Food actually, pyramid? Well, I, I mean, if I wanted to listen to it, yes, but I seemed to be exposed to people that were saying whole foods. It yeah, wasn't. Wow. It wasn't. That was way ahead. That, of the that curve. was the way ahead, and they were talking about whole foods, variety, um, and, and avoidance of sugar and preservatives. So, hey, we've come really. Is it that complicated? Yeah, wow. I don't think it is. And then I also explored postural stress because I was doing a lot of work with a lot of chiropractors, and that led me into working chiropractors with, working on their teeth, or just no, no, no chiropractors sending me patients okay. because they realised that if you had a chronic headache neck ache or jaw pain, mm. then your clenching or grinding of your teeth could have had something to do with it. In fact, it does. So yeah. so unless they had a dentist working on their team to help them deal with the stress in the muscles around the head and neck that they weren't going to get anywhere. Mm. And that introduced me to the world of podiatry as well because the chiropractors that I was working with also realised they needed a dentist to control the top half of the body. They needed a podiatrist to control the bottom half of the body. So I spent the next 10 years exploring nutrition and posture um, and then environment became more of an issue and I did my fellowship in nutritional and environmental medicine at the Australasian College of Nutritional and Environmental Medicine, ACNEM it's called. Mm -hmm. um, so I got my fellowship in uh, nutritional and environmental medicine in 1996 about and uh and I did research at New South Uni um, with the podiatrist on posture and, and chronic pain. So it's just been a journey. I mean, it's mm. been a journey. And, and, and at the end of the day, I still, you know, you come into my surgery, I'm still a dentist. Mm. But I'm a dentist with attitude. Yeah. And, and the attitude is, you know, there's a whole person attached to this mouth. Yeah. And there's a lot of other things to consider. Is it 
should we look at it a bit like functional medicine that instead of just going in and getting your teeth checked that you're actually understanding the the whole life of of the patient and and what's going on so it's an extended consultation oh absolutely i mean yeah. the first appointment in our practice <clears throat> and i'm lucky enough to have five other partners but uh, in my practice um, a new patient exam is an hour yeah where we spend probably the first 20 minutes just taking a good history mm -hmm. and then just getting information and putting it all together we describe ourselves as a patient-centered practice and when people hear that they go yeah well what other kind of practices are there yeah. well actually there are two other kind of practices one is a symptom-based practice where you go in for a problem like for example you could go to doctor's surgery and you're depressed. Mm -hmm. So you get an antidepressant. You've got an inflammation. So you get an anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. You you come in with a broken tooth, so you get it fixed. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a symptom-based practice. Yeah. Uh, another type of practice is a practitioner-based practice, and I think we've all been in those. A lot of medical specialists actually suffer from a, a practitioner-based practice, and some practitioners do too, and that is they have an attitude that the patient is just so lucky to be in their presence that, um, you know, this is all about me and mm. I will impart my wisdom onto you and you will do as I say, et cetera. So that's a practitioner-centred practice. But a patient-centred practice listens to the patient, mm -hmm. combines your knowledge with their knowledge. I, heard, I, I was at a course 30 years ago where a, pa a doctor said, and it was so profound, he said, if you listen to your patients... They'll not only tell you, they'll often not only tell you what's wrong with them, but if you ask them the right questions, they'll also tell you how to fix it. Mm. So that's a patient centered approach to healthcare, whether you're talking about a dentist, a chiro, an osteo, a doctor, or whatever, you know. So there are different models within yeah. a health practice. But for me, you know, I, I kind of recognize as a holistic dentist, because that's what I have described myself as. That it's the, that there's a whole lot more going on here than just fixing teeth. Mm. So do you work with a, a pool of other um, healthcare specialists? I, I have a refer. I have a referral base. A lot of practitioners that I have a great deal of confidence in and that I can refer to. Yeah. Uh, our practice is still very much. We've been down the path. We used to have a nutritionist in our practice. Mm. Well, I actually prefer that not to be in house. I, I actually stick to the dentistry. I used yeah. to have a chiropractor in my practice as well. So so we do the we do the dentistry and, and that way we can build a team around us of like-minded mm. practitioners in different skill sets. Why didn't the other of having a nutritionist it was, in a, it was a bit too restrictive. Yeah. You know, it's too restrictive because hey, you're putting your faith in one person yeah. and and it's so much more interesting to keep an open mind mm. and hear what other practitioners are doing and you've heard them lecture and you think, wow, I, I must Get go on. and see that person. And you go, I like to go and visit practitioners that I, I, I work with get it. and uh, be a patient myself and mm. I kind of get a sense then of, of whether it's a person I'm, I'm dealing with, I want to, I want to refer to. If I have somebody in-house, I've bought into it yeah. and I'm committed to it and yeah. I'm locked into it and that's not a good No, I get it. Me. One philosophy, yep. one, yeah. No, I, I, I absolutely mm. understand that. Tell me on the nutrition side, since your Whole Foods advice back in 1982, what have been the, the big changes, the big furfies, the big breakthroughs, and, and where are we right now? Yeah. Well, um, there's been a lot going on in the last 30 years, that's for sure, and it's called… The last 30 hours has been a lot going on, <laughs> and, and we'll talk about that. Yeah, but I was just driving here tonight and I saw the red sun, and I thought, gee, it's been a, f a week almost since you've been able to look up in the sky yeah. and turn your eyes away because the sun's too bright. Smoking two S packs of Winnie Reds a day we are at the moment, aren't we? It is scary, it's scary. Yeah. But look, nutritionally, I think, you know, what's been happening is industrial uh, – food has become a commodity, mm. you know, and just like healthcare has as well. Yeah. And that is a problem. A massive problem. A massive problem because yeah. uh, it shouldn't be. And it's really, <clears throat> you know, we've been kind of fed this lie that we haven't got enough food to feed the world. Yeah. And so in order to achieve that, what we have to do is clear more land, use more chemicals. Mm. Industrial agriculture, industrial farming is the only way to go. Well, it's actually, uh, you know, part of what I refer to as confusing and contradictory public health messages. Mm. So I think there is that, and that has created a, a perfect storm. In fact, when I talk about nutritional stress, 
people always think I'm going to be talking about hamburgers, chips and hot dogs, mm. pizzas. I actually call nutritional stress, the, the perfect example of nutritional stress is the food pyramid. Mm. The food pyramid came about in the late 70s. It was kind of argued about through the early 80s. And in about 1992, the Food and Drug Administration in America completely endorsed it. And so did all the other health organisations like the Heart Foundation, the Diabetes Council. And from that moment on, if you look at the graph, from that moment on, diabetes and obesity went through the roof. Mm. And cancer has, since 1975, the rate of cancer has gone up 25, 30%. And that is allowing for age. Everyone says, oh, it's because we're getting older. Well, when you do the research and you allow, you factor in age, mm. 25 to 30%. I mean, one in two men, one in three women will contract cancer by the time they're 60, 65. So that's a frightening statistic. So I think industrial agriculture, the use of chemicals has been a major problem. Mm. Another good example, <clears throat> I mean, you know, we've dentistry has been talking about sugar for the last 60 years. And uh, Sarah Wilson, who's who's a patient of ours, and I said, I said yeah, to Sarah's Sarah, coming on in a co uh, beginning of next year. Yeah, yeah, well, and she's a friend of mine too. She's an amazing. She's woman. an amazing yep. woman. And and I said to Sarah, Sarah, you have done more with I Quit Sugar in six or seven or eight years than the dental profession has done in sixty years. Mm. And you know, she's a great communicator, and it's the a power great, of a beautiful uh, woman. Yeah, and a very, yeah. very, but a very powerful message and really well articulated. Very talented woman. Yeah. Yeah. So so sugar has really uh, emerged in the way it should have done 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. But this is part of the problem, Ron, isn't it? Like, you know, when you were talking before about the food pyramid and things, you know, the, the one thing that comes to my mind is just how much conflict are in these decisions. And, you know, that expose that the New York Times came out with a couple of years ago around the sugar industry and then paying off Harvard professors to show that, in fact, it was fat that was causing heart disease when the entire way along the research was showing that it was sugar. And you go, if you can't trust a Harvard professor, in my mind, because I've always grown up to believe that Harvard was the, mm. the beacon of hope for, for excellence and research and, and, and non-conflict and all of those important things, then, then we're all doomed and that there is just so much conflict at every level that, that literally generations have been made sick, overweight, etc., because of very powerful lobby groups, including the, the grain industry and the Monsanto and the sugar industries, etc. It's uh, look, it is a story that is very easy to miss, but once you hear it, it's very difficult to ignore. Mm. And when you do hear it, you could be excused for throwing your hands up in the air and going, "Oh my God, you know, what can I believe? What mm. should I believe? Who can I believe?" You know, and you could just take this really fatalistic view of it all and go. Look, yesterday I was meant to eat fat, now I'm not, or low fat, high fat, grains are good, grains are bad, eggs are good, eggs are not. You know, what the hell, I'm just going to eat whatever I like. Well, yeah. I think when you become aware of this issue, and it is pandemic, it is through every, well, it's certainly through healthcare, mm. that's for sure, and one could argue that it's also through the environment, it's through you know, we're encouraged to be good consumers. Yeah. We're not encouraged to be good citizens. Yeah. And therein lies a fundamental problem. Mm. Um, so, so you know, I think when you when you become aware of it, as I said, easy to miss, difficult to ignore. Mm. My view is that at the end of it, you should emerge from that with only one thing, and that is your health is just too important to leave to anybody else. Mm. You've got to take control of it yourself. And while the world we live in is incredible is becoming more and more complicated the solutions are actually remarkably simple yeah and that's really i think a, a big breakthrough moment for anybody on a health journey yeah I, I couldn't agree more the 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 challenge with it is and when i said before you know in the last 30 hours you know i i'm, I'm sure you've you've watched or aware of this this whole Game Changers documentary and then the debunking by Dr. Chris mm -hmm. Kresser mm -hmm. and then the debate that him and James Wilkes had, the executive producer of. And it's just, uh, it, it's become so divisive, mm. you know, that it's become about plants and animals and 
people are watching a documentary like that and whether you believe it or not, that any education, educated person in this space will tell you that their arguments are flimsy at best, but people are making decisions based on 90 minutes of investment in their health. Mm. And then they take years, decades sometime. You know, we had Tammy Jonas that I spoke about before on, on the on the show last week who it took her a decade of being vegetarian until she had a third child and was so anemic that she was hospitalised through illness to go. There is a place for whole foods, balanced whole foods in, in every diet. But this debate that's raging at the moment is I think just so symptomatic of of where people are they want to be on one side of the fence and they think that there's a silver bullet to to this very complex issue that we've got but a very simple solution mm. and I'm, I'm just curious about one whether you've been following the whole thing mm -hmm. and and two whether you've got a view on it yeah well i have and i've been following it for some time mm. and um look <laughs> people love certainty and uh, they love compelling, you know, visuals, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, so that is. Uh, I, I've seen the movie, and and it's kind of a beautifully produced movie. And I've listened to Chris Cresser and Joe Rogan's. I haven't listened to today's episode. <laughs> I can just imagine. I can. I'm just, only halfway through. I can it, just imagine. It, it, it's, I can it's, just imagine. It's it's horrendous, Ron. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like like literally, J um, James Wilkes assassinates Chris Cresser, mm -hmm. like just like he's a UFC fighter. He literally attacked the guy. Mm -hmm. It was, it, it, it was I, I found it quite disgusting. Mm -hmm. But anyway. Look, it's symptomatic of a whole lot of other things, as you said, going on about polarising, you know, the way we're being polarised. Listen, this is part of what makes clicks. You know, we live in an attention economy. Yeah. So the more clicks you can get, that's all that matters. Mm. And that's another thing that's, that's easy to miss. Yeah. That's easy to miss, but you've got to be aware of it. Mm. So so I, I take a step back from it all. Look, I think I think the first thing is the biggest and most compelling argument is industrial ad, a, animal agriculture. Yeah. The and villain for sure. The vil uh, that, that, is, that yeah. is unquestionable. Yeah. That is what is not good for the animal is generally not good for the human mm. and what is not good for both of them is not good for the planet. So yep. it's a lose, lose, lose situation. Yep. I think, though, I think though, Ron, the one thing that people forget is that they always visualise animal-based agriculture as intensive yep. agriculture, yep. forgetting that the vast majority of plant-based agriculture is also monocultured, industrialised, destructive agriculture. Absolutely. Look... <clears throat> I know you spoke to him uh, just recently, Charlie Arnott. Yeah. He was a guest on my podcast and I, I made regenerative agriculture a very big part yep. of my- Your podcast is- Unstressed. Unstressed, that's right. Unstressed. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And uh, regenerative agriculture is a very favourite topic of mine and I think it's an important one for everybody. Yeah. Explain to, to me your- because I'm a punter with this stuff too. Mm. Explain to me what you understand to be regenerative agriculture- well, regenerative. See, the word sustainable has been thrown a lot, around a lot. Yeah. But the problem with sustainable is so many of our soils and our farms and our land and our environment is degraded already. Yeah, but you just sustainability that, just means it's not going to get any worse. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And what we need is regeneration. Mm. We need soils. I mean, we need soil to grow things in. Yeah. I know industrially the, there'll be lots of corporations lining up to tell us how we could do things hydroponically and we could do them in huge warehouses and we could do this or we could do that. But listen, the human body needs 60 elements. There are mm. 118 elements in the periodic table. We're going back to high school chemistry yeah. or physics. 60 elements. We know what 25 or 30 of those do. Yeah. But in order for those elements to be delivered to us, we need to use the microbes in healthy soil yeah. to, to um, produce food that is nutrient dense. So regeneration is about putting soil back. You see, it takes 500 years for nature to produce one inch of soil. Mm. That's two and a half centimetres of soil for the decimal people, yeah. okay? It takes 500 years. Now, in a, re in a well-managed regenerative agricultural farm where animals are actually part 
of the solution, yeah. not the problem. Yeah. They are part of the solution. We cannot do this without them. Yeah. In, a, in three to five years, you can grow an inch of soil. Yeah, which is full of organic matter. Which is full of organic matter. I mean, you know, yeah. I, again, I am referred to Char- Charlie here. He said something really profound the other day when I was speaking to him and he said, there are some archetypal organisms, animals in the world. The earthworm is mm. one of them. You know, it turns organic matter into castings which enrich the soil, yeah. breaks things down. A bee is another mm. archetypal animal. If we don't have bee, bees, we are in big trouble. Yep. And ruminants are another archetypal animal. Yeah. They take the sun, which grows the grass, they run it through four stomachs, produce meat, and protein, milk, mm. whatever, uh, fat, uh, they then urinate and defecate, mm. and uh, and I heard it's I've heard it said, uh, Paul, that uh, uh, ruminant urine is a beautiful thing, mm. and uh, and you know that obviously piqued my interest. And why is it such a beautiful thing? Because it contains plant growth hormone, mm. and when the when the when the um, ruminant urinates and defecates, it enriches the soil, and then there are even bacteria that it produces in the soil which float up into the sky that's called Pseudonymus syringi, mm. float up into the sky and seed rain. So, so you know, regenerative agriculture is the clever, the clever use of animals mm. in a humane and environmentally sound and in regenerative way mm. to convert sunlight into soil, yeah. to convert sunlight into soil. And when we were in first year high school, we all learnt in biology photosynthesis. Mm. You know, carbon dioxide plus water equals you know carbohydrates and and oxygen. You yeah. know, so that's it's not rocket science. It's not yeah. rocket science. So back to the game changer um, uh, thing. You know, that movie and the whole polarizing. So regenerative to me means that animals are part of the solution, and that's mm. a really important thing. I don't argue at all that animal agriculture is a cruel and unconscionable thing. And the sooner we get into regenerative... Or or, or just industrialised animal agriculture. Uh, Industrialised animal yeah. agriculture in feedlots. In feedlots, in, 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 yeah. pe- in pens, in in big sheds where there are, you know, tens of... Tha- where chickens don't have enough room to move, where yeah. a sow doesn't have enough room to move. If they are doing what they're meant to do, and we have evolved over millions of years mm. in harmony with animals. They're yeah. a part of our journey. They've always been a part of our journey and we should honour them. Mm. We should honour them. We should consider them sacred. But that doesn't mean we should um, not have them as part of our diet. In fact, you know, if you think, we often hear about uh, methane as a problem in in animal agriculture, you know. Yeah. There, there were more um, ruminants roaming the earth 200 years ago before industrial agriculture got a hold of animals than mm. there are today. There were millions and millions of bison roaming around in North America. There were millions of wildebeests and herds of animals mm. moving through the Serengeti. They were all producing methane. Mm. You know, of course. Methane lasts for 11 to 13 years. So, you know, um, that's been going on for a very long time. That's not the problem. Mm. Animals are the perfect recyclers of sunlight and energy and they produce and, and, and as I said, they should be honoured, but they shouldn't be demonised. And this whole idea of being a vegan and monocropping or, or clearing land to grow vegetables well, you know, how big does an animal have to be uh, to make it important to whether it gets killed or not? Yeah. Is it, does, does size matter yeah. to a vegan? I mean, I should ask, that's a really important question. They, 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 they all have this romantic notion that, you know, and Moby, I talk about this guy all the time because he is just so misrepresenting in what he talks about that I've been a vegan for 32 years and he's got vegan for life tattooed on his neck now and mm. animal rights on his arms. Mm. And that argument that you're talking about is how come a cow is more important than a field mice or a bird or a fish or any of the other animals mm. that typically die in most industrial plant-based agriculture, but they don't see it. They don't see it. They don't even want to think that for one moment that plants potentially, and there's a lot of science coming out around it, are actually sentient. 
<laughs> well, I did another really interesting uh, discussion with Fred Provenza, who wrote this book called Nourishment, mm. what we can learn from the wisdom of animals about our nutrition, our nutritional wisdom and what we can learn from animals. And he said, he said exactly that. He said, mm. you know, plants communicate with each other. They communicate with the microbes and the fungi in the soil. Mm. Um, you know, they don't move. It's true. They don't move. But one could all, and if they are under attack, if they are under attack, they will communicate that attack to other plants. Mm. So, um, you know, I said to Fred G, you know, when you put it like that, I, I kind of almost feel guilty killing, a, a, you know, a, bro a piece of broccoli because mm. that's potentially a sentient being. It's just not moving. Mm. Um, so, so, you know, I think this whole, the other thing about it that worries me, and I've asked this of veg vegans, and I still haven't, I'm, I may have missed it, I may have missed it, but I still haven't got a really good answer. And I say this, is there another example in all of human history of a vegan society that has flourished and thrived generation after generation after generation? Mm. Now, I, I may have missed it. I've been interested in this for 40 years. No, and there's, I could, there's I could, not. No one, no one will say that to you. And, you know, they always quote, like even in that Game Changers documentary where they, they talked about the the um, the fighters at the start, that these gladiators lived on a, on a vegan diet. I go, they lived in a fucking prison, people. They got fed what they were given. Mm -hmm. Like the, the wealthy, healthy people were actually given meat to eat. And it's just all of that typical cherry picking. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I know both sides of the argument mm -hmm. do it. And, oh, yeah. and, you know, it's a thing that I will always say that, that we're not for intensive agriculture, particularly intensive animal-based agriculture, but we're not for intensive plant-based agriculture. Like the Impossible Food guys that we had in here, and I had this conversation with them offline, you know, invited them to have it on the podcast, but they weren't up for it, around you are mass-producing soy, which most of the seeds come from Monsanto, one of the most despicable companies on the planet Earth, you know, next to Bayer that bought them. So now you've got two of the ugliest sisters in the room. You then produce it in a massive big facility or multiple manufacturing facilities across the USA. You then ship it by either road in the USA or by plane to other parts of the country to sell in fast food restaurants. And you have the audacity to say that that is good for the environment the animals and for humans, like that is just a gross, either a gross ignorance of science or a gross misrepresentation mm. of, of what people think that they're actually doing. Yeah. Well, Paul, you know, I think people, as I say, people love certainty. I mean, it's what's uh, made religion so popular for so many uh, thousands of years. It does smack of religion, it, it doesn't is, it? It is yeah. very much like that. But, but you know, the other thing, putting aside that, because we could, I'm sure we could go, <laughs> On about this, yeah. but vegetables have their own problems. You of see, course they do. apart from the ethics of of how they're, they're grown, grown yeah. on a massive scale, there are substances within them that potentially have problems: salicylates, oxalates, mm. phytates, fodmaps. You know, which are fructo oligo di and disaccharides and phen polyphenols. Mm. They're all things that. People, if they, you know, I'm eating a, I'm eating a vegetable diet. I should be perfectly healthy. Well, if you're sensitive to salicylates, that may not be such a great idea. Yeah. If you're sensitive to FODMAPs, that may not be such a great idea. Yeah. So, so you know, every food is not without its challenges environmentally mm. or, or nutritionally. Yeah. I think the other thing that has changed in this time, coming back to your original question of what what the developments are. Grains is another interesting one and gluten and a lot of people say, oh, it's just a really trendy thing. Mm. Now, I don't know about you, but if you've ever been out in the country, I was up in northern New South Wales a few months ago uh, and I was noticing that the wheat was really small. You know, and I said, geez, this has got a fair way to go because I remember wheat was about the height Head of high. a human being, yeah. uh, an adult. And uh, they said, no, no, this is all ready to go, you know, and this is all about the modern semi-dwarfed high-yield wheats which mm. have got 50% more gluten in them. 
So, you know, almost all the wheat in Australia, a lot in America and Europe, is grown as this modern semi-dwarfed high-yield wheat. Or GMO. Or GMO. Yeah. Whereas, you know, the wheat of biblical times, you know, let them eat bread and, you know, feed them my daily bread or whatever. I shouldn't be quoting biblical yeah. things. I haven't got no. a clue. But anyway, you know, it's all about emma and einkorn, which are ancient grains. Yeah. But not the modern wheat. So there's another one. Mm. And I guess the most recent thing that has really blown me away because I've been interested in nutrition for a long time mm. is this embracing of hunger or intermittent time-restricted eating and yeah. fasting. I mean, man, how did I ever miss that one? I mean, that I just know. makes so much sense. Yeah. When in human history have we had three meals a day and two snacks? Mm. I mean, that's a great model for for the food industry, but it's mm. not a very good health model. Well, it's it's good for health practitioners because it, it makes people fat and sick. So there's, you know, it's great for pharmaceutical companies. It's great for surgeons. So there's mm. that. It's a great economic model. It's, it's just not a very good health model. Yeah, absolutely. So wh why has it only just now become, and I agree with you, like one of the, 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 the one thing that I've done in my life over the last five years, because my mum died of Alzheimer's, both mum mm -hmm. and dad were medical doctors, clueless about nutrition and mm. and healthcare very good at operating and things like that but is intermittent fasting and it fundamentally changes your life and you're right it was just this addiction to hunger and the perverse thing around it is it costs nothing it actually saves <laughs> so you money cheap. so you can then spend more money on better quality food when you actually do eat mm. but why has it taken till let's call it 2005 and be very generous mm -hmm. for it to become so mainstream and to become such a, a a heavily researched and a heavily supported by some really brilliant minds that it is without doubt one of the most ubiquitous health protocols that we should all adopt. Yeah. Well, I think it's because things have got so bad. I mean, obesity and diabetes is epidemic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obesity is, is everywhere, you know. So I think, uh, you know, when people have been confronted with this epidemic, you've got to go start questioning what's going on. Mm. And, I mean, um, the, the, that, that is where it's really come out of. And, and whether you are talking to somebody about heart disease, cancer, diabetes, obviously, yeah. the lower the insulin level, the better the better yeah. your health will be. Mm. That's just a general rule. The lower the insulin, the better your health. Well, how do you lower your insulin? Well, you eat less sugar, obviously, yeah. but carbohydrates get converted into sugar very quickly. Yeah. So fruits. Fruits. Yeah. You know, I mean, there again, when when in human history did we have 24/7 365 days of the year access to tropical to a, a bowl of tropical fruit salad mm. every single day and juice as well. I mean, you know, you couldn't possibly eat the juice, the the fruit of the juice in a glass of orange juice. Yeah. And yet, you know, it's just as got as much sugar in it as a glass of Coca-Cola. Mm. So I think this was born out of just how bad things have got and then just the use of logic to say, well, if uh, insulin levels are low, how do I do that? And, and along comes, well, firstly, low-carb healthy fats, and I think there is – you know, that's a whole discussion to have. Yeah. Low carb and healthy fat and what does low carb mean and is it the same for everybody? Well, no, it's not. Yeah. Um, but low carb, healthy fat is a good place to start in terms of lowering your blood sugar level and controlling your insulin. Yeah. But then once you've done that, then exploring fasting is also really powerful because there's this thing that happens during fasting called autophagy, mm -hmm. which is the body mopping up uh, damaged or sick cells. Yeah. And the thing that I could never understand, um, and, and you know, I mean, I've had a diagnosis myself of prostate cancer. So, you know, when I had prostate cancer four years ago. How old are you, Ron? I'm 64. Yeah, you look good for 64. Thank, man. thank you, Paul. Um, <laughs> anyway, when I had the cancer, and I knew this beforehand, that they'll, they'll do a PET scan. Mm. Now, what is a PET scan? A PET scan, and this is accepted right across the medical community. Yeah. They inject radioactive glucose into your body they get you to lie still for 10 minutes so that the glucose doesn't go to your muscles, it will preferentially be taken up by the cancer cells because it is well known that glucose is the fuel of cancer cells. So inject radioactive glucose and if you've got a cancer, your body will light up. But does that translate to therapy? 
I mean, I've gone on to the Cancer Council's website because I do most of the cooking at home mm-hmm. and I'm always interested in recipes. I most, most certainly do not go to that website to look for recipes, but yeah. I was just intrigued. And there was a recipe there for a plum pudding where one serving, and, and it was very important that low fat was used, low yeah. fat yogurt, uh, margarine instead of butter, and you know, don't, don't. Anyway, that was the equivalent of seven and a half teaspoons of sugar mm. brought to you. By the, By the cancer, oh, council. cancer council, yeah, uh, and that you could have eaten that on your way out of having a PET scan, mm. uh, where you were injected with radioactive glucose, because the radiologist knew that glucose cancer cells love glucose, but apparently the cancer council hasn't translated that into therapy. Mm. So you know, I think it's because things have got so bad. Do you think that for some people they go? I get it and it makes sense, but how do I not just get sucked into the wh- whether it is you're on, you know, let's look at both sides. You've got the vegans on one side, you've got the carnivores on the other, you've got the intermittent fasters mm. and the whole food, paleo, et cetera, in the middle and then every other yeah. derivative of that around it. People seem to be even more confused now that they're either they're literally taking a side and going, you know what, I'm going to roll the dice, or they're just putting their hands up in exacerbation, like you said before. What do you advise to people? Like, the, the common sense has to prevail, and and everyone's different, and n equals one, and all those things that 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 all of you healthcare practitioners love to talk about, and I think it's it's absolutely relevant. But just some really common sense advice as we come close to what I reckon's the coolest year of ever, twenty twenty, and vision yep. and all those kinds of things. If people starting out in twenty twenty want to be optimally healthy in 2025, no matter what age they are, what's your advice to them, Ron? Well, I think they've got to chill out a little bit. You know, I mean, we love taking sides. Mm -hmm. We love certainty. And as appealing as that is, just keep an open mind. Mm. And realise also that the vast majority of what you are being fed, literally, both literally and metaphorically, is PR. You know, food has become a commodity. And that that movie, The Game Changer, is a good example of, of a commodity that has been promoted there too, mm. you know, so veganism. But but I think firstly just chill out. I think that's really important. Don't look for the one answer. There is no one answer, yeah. number one. Number two, listen to your body. Your body sends you messages each and every day yeah. and you should listen to it. If you're tired, that's not the way things should be. Mm. So that's a really important place to start. I I would recommend that if anybody was starting on a health journey, the first place I would start was spend the next month or two just focusing on getting a consistently good night's sleep. Mm. Don't worry about anything else. Yeah. Just get a consistently good night's sleep. And what does that mean? Well, we could talk about what that means, but mm. I would be focusing on that because yeah. with a consistently good night's sleep, you end up with the physical, mental and emotional energy to make all those other decisions mm. that seem so difficult to make. Yeah. Don't doesn't a good night's sleep isn't it a little bit predicated on what you're eating and some of the other things. I get I agree with you. Because yep. it's a bit like the chicken and the egg because if yep. you're having a bottle of wine before you go to bed, well it's going to impact the quality of your sleep. So while you might be sleeping for seven or eight hours, your sleep's infinitely less beneficial than than if you address the the drinking mm-hmm. as part of I'm going to get better a better night's sleep because there are fundamental things that need to change for me to get that better night's sleep. Well, uh, getting a consistently good night's sleep is the beginning of a very big conversation about exactly all of those things. Mm. But it's just coming at it from another angle. Yeah. You see, um, if you commit, and this is the big step, this is the really big step, you have to prioritise sleep. Yeah. And as soon as you prioritise sleep, then you start talking about, well, what does that mean? Yeah. Well, it's a function of quantity and quality. That's right. Quantity for 90% of the population, it's seven to nine hours of sleep. Yeah, Quality means it's not enough to put your head on the pillow. You've actually got to breathe well while you're asleep. Mm. Okay, that's how we define a consistently good night's sleep. Got it. But how do we get there? And we get there through sleep hygiene. Well, what does that mean? And that means A, prioritising, B, getting into a routine, yeah. C, organising your meals, 
So you're not eating for two or three hours before. Yeah. You know, wine, alcohol is a great example of something that will help you get to sleep, but it won't give you a very good night's sleep. Mm. So, you know, priority, again, is sleep your priority? Yeah. So I invite people on that journey to say, hey, do a do a, a one do it for a month or two. Benchmark yourself to see how well you can feel, mm. and then you know what you're compromising on. You know the whole interaction with technology is another part of a consistently good night's sleep. The blue light, and that has and well, it's not just blue light. Blue light is one thing, and yeah. the melatonin and all that. Yeah. But the other thing is that's no time to to uh, connect with the world, mm. and our and our minds start ticking away, and we shouldn't be connecting and solving problems. Sleep is a time to connect with your pillow, not with the world. Mm. So, so you know, switching off all technology an hour before you go to bed, moving it out of your bedroom. Your bedroom is for sleep and sex, you know. It's not for anything else. Yeah. So just, you know, uh, so, so as soon as you accept that sleep is where you want to start, it starts a whole conversation mm. about your routine, your yeah. eating, your drinking, when you finish drinking caffeine and the whole range of other stuff. Yeah, no, I love it. I think the only thing that I would challenge you on and, you know, the reason I say this is because we ran a pilot program here at, at VIX six months ago now with – because it's a very dynamic, fast-moving, stressful business where we deal with chefs and suppliers and, you know, half of our workforce work overnight in a cold box. And, and so we took a group of 13 people and put them through a Vedic meditation program. Mm. And it had such a profound effect on people that I think for most human beings, the investment in both the time and the money to get proper instruction mm. and get that check up from a neck up and, and start sitting still for at least 20 minutes a day and ideally two times 20 minutes a day is probably the, the most effective protocol to – then lead to better quality sleep, to then lead to better yep. quality de decision makings, particularly with those addictive behaviours, whether it's food or booze or cigarettes or gambling or sex or whatever it happens mm. to be, you know. So. I, I, I look, I agree with you, Paul. I really do. I think the power of meditation is huge mm. and, and it can turn a person's whole life around and it's turned many people's lives around. So, you know, there are many. We've done quite a few programs and I spoke to Tom Cronin not that long yeah, ago. Yeah, I know Tom um, well. Yeah, yeah, and his whole uh, The Portal and that movie that he put together. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet. Have you seen I it? I haven't seen it. I, yeah. sp I spoke to him about it before. Tom and I left the corporate world at the same time and, you know, went slightly different paths, but I've, I've followed his mm. commitment to… Yeah, I think it's great. I mean, I think yeah. it's an absolute… You, you know, I mean, I've heard it said, I'm not sure whether this is quite true, but I wouldn't be surprised if 20 minutes of uh, meditation is equivalent to two hours of sleep. Hour and a half to two hours, they say. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. what the, the guy that we had in here yeah. teaching us said. Yeah. You know, so, so, you know, I, and I think just the quietening of the mind, mm. the opportunity to reflect. I mean, we live in this attention economy mm. where we are, we really have no downtime mm. and that, makes it very hard yeah. to get to sleep. So, yeah. so yeah, I don't – look, I, when I say this, and, and I'm, I have a diagram, if you like, uh, Paul, you know, where I've got five stresses and five pillars, and they're all interrelated. Mm. It's not a linear thing. I mean, I picked that out, but, you know, you could, you could look at new, the impact of nutrition on mm. how you breathe and how you breathe on how well you sleep, mm. how you breathe on how you think, you know, how you breathe affects whether your anxiety levels are up or down or not. Yeah. How you breathe is an important part of meditation. Yeah, of so, course. So, you know, you can attack this from lots of different ways. I, I kind of have a vision of – the way our health is as a kind of a balancing beam. Mm. And on one side of the scale, you want to identify and minimise any stress that can compromise your immune system or cause chronic inflammation. So that's yeah. one side. And they're the five stresses, emotional, environmental, postural, nutritional, and dental. Mm -hmm. On the other side, build resilience. You've got to build resilience to face the challenges of our modern world. Yeah. So- while you're minimising the stresses, build resilience by focusing on sleep, breathe, nourish, move and think. Yeah. And if you see it as a balancing beam, the fulcrum is actually our genes mm. and our epigenetics, how yeah. our genes express themselves. So our life is a balancing act, if yeah, you like. And, I get it. and, you know, it's kind of that's the model that I think 
if I was advising somebody how would do. you approach 2020, I'd go, take a, take a step back from it all. Don't take it all too seriously. I mean, yeah. it's a percentage game. I don't know about you, Paul, but for me, 80-20 is, is a reasonable thing to shoot for. Yeah. You know, like everyone's got to pick their own. Like if your life is 50-50, like mm. 50%, you're going hell for leather and eating crap and drinking yourself to – buggery and mm. and 20% and 50% of the time I'm really good yeah. well you're kidding yourself 60 40 I don't think that's good enough 70 30 hmm yeah. you're approaching at 80 20s 80 20 poles doing it yeah. minimum when I'm on fire I'm 90 10 yeah. And if I'm a hundred percent or I'm a pain in the ass and no one wants to be with me. Yeah, I agree with that. I think I think the world doesn't need another teetotaling vegan. It's, no, it's, no, don't take yourself sorry, too seriously. I should seriously. say vegan or carnivores. Carnivore, I just I think anybody. anyone that's just just too extreme. Yeah. Except for Aaron because he's just a, no, he's a awesome. freakishly kind guy <laughs> and I think he's just put his body up for for a, hu a awesome. human experiment. I think the other thing that with the meditation for me is Two, the two points here is that learning to be uncomfortable, um, that as a society we've become so dislocated from a willingness to be in pain, you know, and I say this with the greatest respect, my, while my wife gets really bad period pain, she reaches for painkillers so quickly it frightens me, mm. you know, and similarly I'm, I'm sure you see it whether it's teeth or whether mm. it's mm. inflammation that we all go for that yep. and that meditation, much to people's disgust because they they visualise it as this, you go to this peaceful place and I'm yet to meet anyone that meditates regularly that finds it uh, a, mm. a happy place most of the time is you need to just sit and be alone and do nothing with your thoughts. Yeah. Whether that's what you're going to eat, what you did wrong, what you're going to do tomorrow, how fucked up your life has become, whatever it happens to be, just sitting still and being at peace with being discomfortable or uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And uh, look, it's so I almost can you can almost think of it like some people often ask me because I'm obviously my show Unstress and the book uh, Life Less Stressed, but mm. but you know, is all stress bad and it's not. I mean, it's exercise like, is a stress yeah, on your body. Work's a stress. Uh, well, um, you know, yeah, well, how you think about work yeah. is really important. If yeah. you think your work is killing you mm. and really, oh, I can't stand the stress, then it is killing you. Mm, but if you yeah. think your work is the best, I just love it. Yes, I'm so busy, but I love what I do. Well, that's a different kind of stress. Yeah. Um, fasting is a stress on the body. Saunas are a stress on the body. And one yeah. could even argue sitting quietly in meditative is state a is a stress on your yeah, mind. Absolutely. And it's a good thing to put yourself through. Yeah, no, I agree. So what? Are, what's your uh, – I want to see what your philosophy is because I, I, I get the gist that you're going to be very balanced and agnostic with your advice on this. What is your personal nutritional protocol? Well, for probably five days of the week, I, I do only eat 16, eight, you know, so uh, 16 I don't eat and eight hours I do. So yep. I'll, I'll have- um, From dinner through till lunch. From dinner through till about yep. one. Yep. Um, and once, once a week- Do you have coffee in that? I do. Yeah. I do have coffee. Yeah. But once a week- Life I, without coffee is not <laughs> worth living. Oh, look, uh, you know, yeah, I've got the hang of it. It's yeah. taken me a while. I've been yeah. a late late developer on coffee. Really? Yeah, I have. Wow. But anyway, um, so, and once a week I will do a 24-hour fast. Yeah. Um, but the other days, you know, like there's a, a day tomorrow, for example, where our whole family goes out for breakfast. I go out with my daughters and my grandchildren and we mm. have breakfast somewhere in Bronte and, and, and I love that and I'm not going to yeah. not do it because of, of that. So, so there's that. I, I mean, most of my food is fresh. Yeah. The only sort of processed food that I eat, if you can call it that, would be a tin of coconut cream yeah. or a tin of uh, tomatoes. Um, but the rest of it is fresh. I order almost all my vegetables through a service called Ubi yeah. out of our own backyard and it kind of gives me… Ubi? Ubi. How do you spell it? O-O-O-B-Y. O and o o o b y and it stands for out of our own backyard. Oh, so awesome! You, so you can and they're just here in Sydney. Yeah, and you can just uh, go online and you can pick out um, you can pick out vegetables and decide in what kind of radius you want to work within. You know, so if you're sticking just within two hundred, four hundred, or seven or eight hundred kilometers, or it even goes up to about twelve hundred kilometers, yeah. I think. So it's lo relatively local. It's yeah. mostly organic or yeah. near organic. 
but it's and it doesn't come packaged in plastic mm-hmm. and it gets delivered to my door. So Lovely. I like that. Um, I do enjoy going out shopping. So farmers markets are always a joy. Yeah. Um, can particularly if you can connect with the farmer. Mm-hmm. Um, my meats are always orga- you know usually organic. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's generally where I you know I shop at a, at a in Bondi and Bondi Road there, or sometimes with Dom O'Neill in Ethical Farmers, yeah. and sometimes through Feather and Bone. Yeah, you know, so I kind of um, uh, that's my meat. And yeah, uh, are you predominantly pasture fed when it comes? No, absolutely, to, yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, I was in a Japanese restaurant with a group of people. Um, a few weeks ago and I looked and you had to go and pick your meat out mm. and I looked at the meat and I th- and I could see sure as eggs it was grain fed it was so marpled of course that I couldn't have been anything else so I went up to the chef and I said excuse me is this meat grain fed or grass fed and he very very proudly said to me oh no sir it's 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 grain fed grain fed yeah. and I said Thank you very much. I won't be having it tonight. Yeah. So, so you know, I do not eat. Uh, I don't eat factory farmed meat. I mean, yeah. I try to make a a particular point of that, and I don't eat as much meat as I used to. Mm. Um, but but you know, that's um, that's kind of fats, butter, lots of butter, yeah, lots of coconut oil, olive oil. Um, I use sesame seed oil. Drink. I, I still think water's the best. I use a reverse osmosis water filter and I take a few grains, which takes everything out. Yeah. Everything, every mineral out as well. So I put, so I've literally got pure water and I put a couple of grains of Himalayan rock salt in that. And bingo, I've got my own very clean mineral water, which doesn't come in a bottle or, or you know. So, so there's that. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I moderate moderate amount of alcohol. I yeah. mean, I in my life I have certainly been a social drinker. Yeah, and there have definitely been times when I've been too social. Yeah, um, me for decades. But yeah, you yeah. Know, so what I, do you call a moderate drinker? Well, now now I I would I actually um, a glass of wine would be it. You know, maybe. Three times, four times a week. We can have one glass of yeah, wine. Yeah, and if yeah. I'm out with other people, what I'll generally do is have a spritz. So I'll have a little bit of white wine or rosé. Yeah. <laughs> it's a terrible thing for any wine grower to hear this. But anyway, I'll have a glass of ro- a little glass of wine and top it up with some mineral water, water and it looks like I'm having a sparkling champagne and yeah. and I'm hydrating myself. So yeah. but listen, I you know, I have I have been a very uh, keen drinker, you know. I, and I, to what age? So when did you start that kind of discipline? Oh, that the food kind of thing? No, the the alcohol. Oh, the alcohol. Probably in the last five or ten years. Yeah, okay. You know, in the good, last five good. or ten years. Yeah. I've come to it relatively late in life. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've worked in a in a job that is very stressful. Mm. And uh You're still working every day? I no, I only do two days a week in yeah. the clinic. I'm two days a week in my two to three days, although my wife says I do four days in my home office or five days. Yeah. But um, – Where you're doing your podcast I'm doing and pod- you're reading and you're – sorry, yeah. you're, you're writing yeah. and – Yeah, yeah. And so you're doing I, some presenting stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So that keeps me busy and I really enjoy it. You know, she has to – I need my family around me to temper me. Yeah. You know, I suffer from chronic over-optimism and enthusiasm. Mm-hmm. So I need to That's be, a good I disease need to, be to have. Tempered, yeah. tempered. I warn people about that before yeah. I start working with them. Yeah. Um, so, so that's kind of the regime that I've followed. And, and you know, I got this diagnosis uh, four years ago when I was 60. Didn't surprise me at all. In yeah. fact, um, you know, I got a newfound uh, respect for family history where my father had it at 60, my brother had it at 60, my uncle had it at 60. So, you know... Um, every podcast that I've done, Paul, and I'll warn you about this because, you know, if you do a podcast on vitamin D, yeah. you'll go off and get your vitamin D levels checked. I yeah. did. Yeah. Mine were at 30. Yeah. That's shocking. And it's probably been like that for 30 or 40 Where's years. Where's optimal? Optimal is somewhere around uh, 60 to 100. That's optimal or uh, RDA? Uh, uh, well, that's probably uh, uh, RDA is around uh, 60 to 90. I think 100 to 120 would be, be optimal. ideal. And that's what, how do you, what, what's it measured in? Milli- oh, God, don't ask millimoles me Millimoles. Millimoles per yeah, milliliter okay, or yeah. something. So but, 120. But, you know, whatever yeah. the Australian standard of yeah. vitamin D is. So did you start supplementing? I did. Yeah. I did. And, and how do you take that? I take it as a spray under the tongue, K2 and, and vitamin D. Yeah. I did another pro- What's K2? Well, K2 is one of those fat-soluble vitamins. So you actually need fat-soluble vitamins to absorb your minerals and Mm -hmm. vitamins. So fat-soluble vitamins are A, D, E, and K. Mm -hmm. And D is kind of the 
granddaddy of them all. You know, it's a really important um, hormone and, and, and vitamin for so many reasons. Mm. It's an anti-cancer one. Okay, so I did a program on vitamin D, got vitamin D deficiency. Yeah. I did another program on MTHFR, which is a, a yeah. which is a methylation gene yeah. that we have, you know, and if you don't methylate, your gene, if you don't methylate your vitamin B particularly, and then then you are really you're really stuffed, and mm. you shouldn't be drinking alcohol. That's for sure. Well, I've got both genes that are MTHFR homozygous, which means I haven't been methylating for yonks. Um, then I did another one with my cardiologist, who said, uh, "This is Ross Walker," and I said, "Ross," um, and Ross said, "Look, you've got to do a calcium CT score. All the rest of these angiograms and this is bullshit. Yeah. Do a calcium CT score." And so calcium around your heart. Or in your body right. in general, around your heart, around your heart. Yeah. yeah. So, so <laughs> he says, um, if you score over four hundred, don't read Tolstoy, <laughs> right? So, of course, <laughs> my wife's told me this many times. Stop interviewing people because you go off and you do all the tests they tell you to do. And so then I you went get sick. What's that? What's that disease? Munchausen's or something? <laughs> well, I'm not there. I haven't done a program on that yet, but I may. There you go, I'm man. Made. That's my idea for you. Yeah. And anyway, so I did my calcium CT score six hundred and fifty. Yeah. So a family history of heart disease. And then I looked at the US Department of Labor and they looked at 950 jobs in America to work out which were the worst for people's health. Dentistry's up there. Suicide number, rate too, yeah. Number one, two, and three. Yeah, wow. Dental hygienist, dental nurse, and dentist, number one, two, and three. And in 950 jobs, you can imagine how many god-awful jobs there are. <laughs> right? So when I got a diagnosis, I wasn't surprised. Oh, my God. You know, so so I'm fortunate. I mean, I've been lucky. Yeah. And, and I was, well, <laughs> I used to think I was very healthy before I got that diagnosis. Mm. I've always thought of myself as healthy. I've certainly got a lot of energy. Yeah. And, and I've, For you know, sure. and, uh, and so I've been healthy, but, you know, family history, environment, stress, all these other things play yeah. a role. And, and you, you've got to roll with that mm. and deal with it. Yep. What are you doing on the exercise front? Well, that's an interesting one because the way I met Aaron was in 2006. He came to a talk I gave and I started working out with Aaron uh, for like I would go to his uh, his gym, yeah. Origin of Energy, which is just like no other workout. Now. I haven't been yet, but I follow oh. him closely and, yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's incredible. It's incredible. Yeah. And it's always been incredible. Mm. It's always been incredible. And he's evolved. I mean, he would probably reflect on things he was doing 10 or 12 years ago and think, oh my God, how could I do that, you know? Mm. But but he's he's constantly evolving and and um, so that was my, my main um, introduction. Mm -hmm. I mean, through my growing up, I used to row, I used to play soccer and – and rugby and all that sort of crazy stuff, but yeah. but I um, but through Aaron, I um, I was got into functional movements, Movement, yeah, and that made a huge difference Agree. to me. And I would go to the gym there three or four times a week, and it was a great community. And now after my after my cancer, what I ended up doing was just starting to work out at home using a lot of the. Um, a lot of the movements that he's shown, and yeah. I occasionally touch base with Aaron, mm. and he and he'll top me up. And and you know, part of the liberation for me is to learn that less is more. You know, if you do, ten I think that's the biggest one, Ron, big isn't one. it? Big you one. You know, and he actually says it, and and I say to to all of my friends too that, you know, you don't have to do much, and I think. Everyone, whether it's Origin of Energy, Foundation Training is a, another really great one, which I, th I think under Johnny Gannon here in Australia called Posture Strong, that learning some functional movement, walking and then having a hobby, whether it's surfing or swimming or skiing or whatever it happens to be. I don't think push bike riding in this city is a good thing for your health anymore, but, but just doing things that make you happy as opposed to feeling like something else that's going to yeah. – be an obligation is is without doubt the most sustainable thing. Yeah, well, I mean, for for me now, and and this is I have done this for the last twenty five or thirty years anyway. Every morning when I wake up, I do six to ten rounds of salute to the sun, mm, the yoga nice. exercise. Yeah, and the difference that makes is humongous. Yeah. I mean, it is just the best exercise yeah. to do. So I do that. That's my start. That's Amazing. the very first thing I do. I'm still yeah. in my pajamas. I don't have to get changed. Yeah, I got a yoga mat next to my bed. I should. <laughs> I said, you know, it's only in there for anyway. Uh, so I do have a yoga mat next to my bed. There, I, there yeah. it is. But nice. I do that, and then three times a week now, I do a 
15 to 20 minute workout yeah. using functional movements. Yeah, nice. Where I just do, and, and I combine weight bearing in that. So I've got some kettlebells, I've got some barbells, I've got a Swiss ball. Yeah. Um, and that's it. That's it. I just do that three times a week and I incorporate some core exercise like a plank or, or mm. other stuff into that. And I, I'm really happy with that. You know, I can roll out of bed at 5.30 in the morning and I'm done by 6. 5.36, yeah. Yeah, yeah I yeah, agree. Like, yeah, yeah my, mine's 10 to 12 minutes. Yeah, yeah. You know, it doesn't you, need to be You can do it in a hotel room. Yep. You can do some of it at the airport. And yeah. you mentioned walking. I mean, the last eight years I've walked across Europe. I mean, I've literally walked across Spain. Yeah, amazing. I did the Camino and I've walked through France and now th more recently through Italy. And yeah. walking is the best exercise because you can do it forever. Yeah. You can talk to somebody while you do it. You yeah. can smell it. You can see it. You mm. can listen to it. Agree. You know, it is and it slows you down. You know, mm. we get in planes and fly over places. We drive through places. Mm. But walk towards it. See a village in the distance. Watch it approach. Get close to it. Walk through it. Smell it. Feel it. Hear it. Taste mm. it. And walk out of it. Total different experience. Yeah. No, I couldn't agree more. And I'm assuming that your wife is maybe wrongly or rightly, but that oh, she, yeah. she's right into yeah. the the whole holistic health and, and supportive of you and those things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I look, I'm, you know, one of the things that I've learnt probably more than anything over in the last 40 years of, um, of healthcare is gratitude. Mm. And, uh, you know, I have a great deal to be grateful for. And mm. my wife is one of those things that I'm internally grateful for. Uh, incredibly supportive. We have a lot of fun together and yeah. uh, I'm, I'm lucky, you know, yeah. very lucky. It's interesting, isn't it? And how many kids have you got, Ron? I've got two two daughters. Two daughters. How old? 33 and 30. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I saw two people. I saw. I was in the lift at work a few uh, a few weeks ago and there were this uh, family with two little girls that were five and seven. Yeah. And I looked at them and I said, you know, I've got two little girls myself. And they said, oh, really? How old are they? And I said, they're 33 and 30, but they were that age, just about five five yeah. minutes ago it happens really quickly but i got i've actually got grandchildren now paul so it just doesn't get any better than that i Good mean i'm so you. grateful yeah but what i was going yeah. to say was that 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 family unit and the community and you know all of the studies the blue zones and the china study and all these different ones that that is at the core of everything absolutely well you know that that study that was done out of harvard you mentioned harvard mm. before the longest study ever done on health, wellness, and longevity. 75 years it's been going. Damn. In, in Harvard. What's it called, do you know? Oh, geez. I longevity think it's a longevity study. study. Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah, guessing. It rings a bell. Yeah. And anyway, what they found was that the best predictor of health, wellness, and longevity, better than heart, better than high blood pressure, better than cholesterol, but even better than, smoke, you know, you name it, mm. is relationships. Yeah, wow. Real relationships. And if you're fortunate enough to have a significant other, that's one thing. But relationships means friends, family, community, mm. you know, being part of a club or or, or a church or, or a religion, whatever, mm. but being feeling connected. Then that's part of our biggest challenge now. And this is about polarization and looking. This is we're going around in back Circles, to the beginning, but yeah. but this is part of the problem why yeah. we are grasping for certainty and we're looking for tribes to belong to mm. because we're not belong. You know, they did another study where they asked how many. This was like twenty five years ago. They asked how many people in your life could you really rely on mm. if you had to, and the average in that study was two and a half people. Wow! And they asked people today. How many people could you? And the average is something like 0.7, right? Now I'm not sure. I'm not sure what a 0.7 person looks like, but I suspect they're looking at their phone a hell of a lot of the time. So we're probably seeing a lot that's, of 0 0.7 people. That's staggering. But that's scary. Mm. And that, and then, and then you look at mental health. What's going on there, particularly in young? Mm. You know, when we talk about getting older, that's why we're getting sicker. Well, let's look at our kids. They're not getting older. Mm. How are they doing? Not real well, as it turns out. Yeah, no, there are some big problems and you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And even at work, you know, it's one thing that we've been working on really hard for a couple of years now is creating an environment. And, you know, we've got multiple sites here, Melbourne, two retail stores where people genuinely do belong. And the pain that you have to go through in removing certain people from a business to get you to that point, you know, that that's been for us a really rewarding but a really rocky 
path to take, you know, and I think I've almost given Anthony a, a heart attack on on multiple occasions, but we genuinely do now have a business of, you know, 160 to 190 people at any point in time where people think of this place as a, as a family and that they come to work and they can feel safe for most of the time. Mm. And that's that's an ongoing thing. Mm. You know, it's like tapping a hoop along. Yeah. You know, you stop tapping. Oh, it, it falls it, over. It falls over. No and, vaccinations. Yeah. Whether yeah. it's sleep, food, exercise yeah. or community. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Marriage, whatever it yep. happens to be. Yep. Yeah. Ron, it's um, time for you to get home to your beautiful family, my friend. It's, what is it, 8 o'clock, Louis? Yeah, roughly, yeah. 8 o'clock. You do even eat at this time of the night or it's I've, too late for you? have already I've eaten. I've already eaten. I've Fuck already you, eaten. good. What about me? I've been here all day, man. I'm going <laughs> to fucking go home and eat a steak. Oh, no. Past your fed, though. Okay, okay. Well, you know, stay up for two hours at I least. I will, man. To, I will. I'll have a small. I'll go for a walk too, <laughs> man. Good. Yeah. I really appreciate you coming on, man. Like it's, it's the second last one we're doing this year and it's a really – you know, I, I, where I started, you're you're very atypical for a, a, a dental doctor, and I think it's it's amazing the work you do. And for a guy that's 64, you you really do, obviously live and breathe what you what you're preaching. So for for those that don't follow you, I'm I'm imagining you're going to have a whole lot more people that do from now on. How do they find your podcast? It's well, you can go onto iTunes, uh, Unstress, Unstress, Unstress with Dr. Ron Ehrlich, or you can go onto my website, which is Dr. Ron Ehrlich, which is D R R O N E H R L I C H dot com. Um, and there's a lot of stuff on there. You can there. find your book and, and that book all and that stuff. Yeah, there's a whole lot of good stuff on there. We've even got our own app, yeah. Unstress oh, app. Look at you, man. That? You're like the <laughs> fucking the most evolved 64 year old I've met in a long time. Oh, thanks for having me. Paul. Pleasure, my man. Thank you.